guppies to groupers, tropical and marine fish in the home aquarium. Your host, Paul Spies. The average hobbyist usually starts with a 10 gallon aquarium or something around that size. And as time goes by, he collects the live bears and the small tetras and barbs. And the day comes finally that he falls in love with his first cichlid. That's what we're gonna talk about today, cichlids. He sees a Jack Dempsey or a little Oscar and he decides, boy, I've gotta have that in my aquarium. And maybe at that point he gets lucky. Maybe one of his uh, more experienced hobbyist friends says, uh, gee, don't put that in your tank. Or the guy at the pet shop knows what they've been buying and he says, that's not for you. Or maybe they find out the hard way and they put a small Oscar in and he grows and grows and grows and all of a sudden overnight, he finds some of the small fish missing. Well, you can't fault the Oscar for that. Uh, you know, Mrs. Johnson gets real excited when her sword tail eats a baby's or eats a neon or something and she says, oh, it's a cannibal. That's the way things go down on the bottom there. You wanna remember one thing, if a fish can get another fish in its mouth, it will, with rare exception. So we're gonna take a look at cichlids today. And most of them are big fish, aggressive fish, but beautiful fish. That's why people get into the keeping the cichlids. And we'll see if we can't give them something to eat. Old Charlie Brown here in particular is very tame. old Oscar there, astronaut of Sausalatus, you can feed him too. He's a big fish. You see the size of the mouth on that when he opens it up. And there's a little one, a little nervous because he's next to the big guy. Size dominates in the cichlid aquarium quite a bit. But beautiful fish. That's big. There's a couple of them there together. Now coming up into the picture there is a uh, one of the red devils, Cichlosoma erythrium. That's a color phase of the red devil that we're looking at. They get cleared on into the whites and golds that you see there, and that's a male. You see the extension of the top fin, the dorsal fin, those fine hair-like filaments? And the same thing is true on the anal fin. You can sex them very easily that way. Now the fish don't need those things to tell each other apart. They just grow them so that the hobbyists can tell them. But uh, the red devil, and some of them are quite brilliant red and mottled. Ah, here's a severum, Cyclosoma severum. This is a sort of a middle of the range in terms of aggressiveness in that. Nice addition to the tank and uh, as I say, uh, not too aggressive. There's the old horse face, uh, Diophagus juriperi. And this guy's a real gravel shredder. That mouth of his is adapted, there he goes now. You watch, you see the rocks coming out through the gills, see? He goes through the gravel constantly. And that's what that name means, geophagus, means earth eater. So you can expect him to be digging all the time, moving the dirt around. In fact, most of these cichlids, you can expect that. So your aquarium is gonna be changed constantly. And you notice all plastic plants in here. Uh, there's a Jack Dempsey. That's Cyclosoma octafasciatum. That's a beautiful fish. Boy, it's got those deep blues in it, a metallic spangles almost. Very attractive, but uh, quite aggressive. It didn't get that name Jack Dempsey for no reason at all. It really, really can take good care of itself. So, big cichlids, more work. Now you may have noticed in that tank as we pan through it, that there are fish in there other than cichlids. There are Oh, some black sharks in there and a couple of armored cats, a big placostomus. And uh, <clears throat> of course, these are in there as scavengers. And they do well in an aquarium like this because they can handle themselves. They, they don't get bothered by the cichlids. So mostly in terms of scavengers, though. There are other fish you could put in here. I mentioned these because they're not cichlids. By the way, here's an excellent scavenger. This guy here, an old hermit crab. He really goes through that gravel. Everything he comes to, he picks up and tries to eat it, taste it, see if it's edible. Necessary to the aquarium, any of the scavengers. Now, as we've seen, the cichlid keeper has got to be a little different. 
than the average neon live bearer kind of a keeper because there's problems connected. We're gonna talk a lot about that. I'd like to read uh, what Dr. Goldstein has to say about what he calls the cyclidiate, the cyclid idiot. He says the, cyc the cyclidiot is a fanatic. He cannot be expected to behave rationally when it comes to his hobby. He can't be expected to pay any attention to the non-spoken considerations normal people give to their wives and children. He'd rather watch his fish than the ball game, clean tanks than mow the lawn or fix a leaky faucet. He'd rather travel 20 miles to a fish friend's house than down to the store for a bottle of milk. And he'd rather move a 100-gallon tank than take out the garbage. Well, that's only natural. Why wouldn't he? Such is the nature of a cichlid lover. I like them myself. I've always kept cichlids. Well, come to the issue. What is a cichlid? Let's take a look at what makes up a cichlid. Put the old scratch board up here. The name cichlid comes from the family name, which includes all these fish. Cichlidae. Cyclidae. That's the family, if you will. Just to give you some feel for this structure. Family. Now, if we were talking, for instance, about the Oscar, which we saw there, that real big fish, which is Astronautus oscillatus. Astronautus. And that's the genus. and oscillatus. That's the species. Always a capital, never a capital. So family, genus, and species. And we're talking about cichlids. That's where the name comes from, the family itself. Now let's see what a cichlid really is. This is a typical cichlid shape. There's a lot to be said about this. Uh, although it is typical, the uh, shape varies considerably from the ones that we've been looking at in the big tank. Most of them were of a shape, if you will. Some of these are very high with respect to their length, and at that time, very thin, like the discus. Let's take a look at a discus, and we'll see what what the scientist means when he says a fish is laterally compressed. There's the discus right there. That's the one with the real high fin there. That, in fact, that's Symphysodon discus. We can get him out where we can look at him a little better. We'll be back here in a little while. Come on, buddy. There. A little shy. But that's a laterally compressed fish, and that refers to the extreme height versus that very uh, thin body. Now you compare that to the other extreme, which is the pike cichlid, and uh, you'll see a very long cylindrical shaped fish. Now these get quite large. In fact, there was one in the big tank that we didn't see. This is the Crenocicla lepidota, and a typical pike shape for you fishermen, you see that that is long, slender fish. So you compare those with uh, the typical cichlid shape, and you can see there's quite a variation in it. They also vary considerably in size from uh, so some cichlids that mature at about an inch and a quarter long, and some that are very large fish, 30 inches, quite heavy, and food fish. Both these extremes come from Africa. But in general, the cichlid has all of the fins that we normally associate with the fish, except this little fin that occasionally shows on some of the catfish and the tetras, the adipose fin. There's no adipose on the cichlids. The single fins, the dorsal and the anal fin and the caudal fin are well developed, as we saw in some of them, the, uh, especially the South American cichlids. There's a development of the uh, dorsal 
rays here and the anal rays on the males, which make it very easy to sex them. The, this growth of this soft ray out here and again up here on the dorsal. These, uh, both of these fins have uh, spiny rays in the front, three or four of them, and then soft rays in the back. If you pick a cichlid up with your hand, you can expect to get a pretty good puncture if you're not careful from the rays in this area and right down in here. The eyes are very prominent in the cichlids. Large, they can perceive color. Lips are large, the mouths are large. And the teeth are very well developed. Teeth are all over the lips and in many of the bones on the inside of the mouth. The lateral line is split. There are two lateral lines on the cichlids right here, and we'll see some very prominent lateral lines when we get around to looking at the fish. These, are, as you recall, are not just a, a line, if you will, but they are an array of special cells that allow the fish to sense vibration. So you fishermen that have always said, well, you know, watch your shadow or don't walk too heavy. Walking heavy is what triggers the fish that are hiding under the bank and that they feel that. So I guess that's about what we want to say about the cichlids there. Again, as I say, they have large prominent teeth. They vary considerably in the mouth structure and that is, is a big separation in terms of definition of the fish. We'll talk about one particular one when we get to that. Now, where do cichlids come from? Well, this shaded area here, by the way, represents what would be the tropical climate, if you will, where we find most of our fish. And we find cichlids in uh, North America, one species, in the Central America, and all throughout South America, we find many, many species of uh, cichlids in Africa here. And in Asia, we find uh, over in near India, one species of cichlid. There's a couple of African ones that have gotten up into the area around Palestine. But this particular species that's in Asia is the only one that's really native to Asia. We can take a look at that one. That's these uh, small orange chromides. This again is a good fish for the beginner. It breeds very easily. Probably wants a little salt in the water, but an excellent parent. And uh, as I say, breeds very easily. Eutropolis maculatus, the orange chromide. It has, uh, there's one other fish in this species that is a cousin to this one. Another Eutropolis gets very large. But this one is a quite common. Thing. I might mention that the cichlids uh, fall in, uh, if you go one step above fam family, you hit the order, and that order includes perch, fish like that, so you get a structure that's fairly similar. Now, what are the rules for keeping the fish? Well, remember off. You're going to keep cichlids, remember off. One of a kind, one of a kind. Because if you put a pair of them in and they happen to set up housekeeping, they're going to just really raise cain with the rest of them. Good food and good filtration. Very simple. The practices, the keeping of cichlids is... Uh, very easily done. Now, the cichlids have some amazing behavioral patterns. They're rather highly developed fish. As you can see, uh, they readily come up. They overcome timidity very easily. Uh, a lot of these fish will eat right out of my hand now, and that's after not too long association. Uh, the typical dwarf cichlid, as the hobbyists refer to them, which is a really a catch-all kind of a name, but it refers to a group of cichlids that don't get any size to them. Nice, smaller fish, easier to keep because you don't need so, quite so much room. But these fish in particular have a very highly developed territorial instinct. That is, they take over an area of the aquarium. It might be a cave they dug under a rock. It might just be a corner of the aquarium, whatever. You've got to expect that 
to blossom in your aquarium. Now, if you go into the pet shop and, and you look in the aquarium and there's maybe a couple dozen of these in a 15 or 20 gallon aquarium, there's so many of them that a guy just can't get off in the corner by himself. So this territorial instinct is subdued somewhat. Now you take a couple of them home and set them up and all of a sudden this comes to the front again and you've seen the same kind of thing in your backyard with the very dominant birds like blue jays or the bear which stakes out a claim. It's that same kind of thing. <clears throat> and woe betide the guy who comes into the wrong backyard, especially when they're breeding. You have to really expect a lot of uh, aggression when the fish are breeding. I set up a 50-gallon uh, community tank, and I had some small cichlids in there. And I had a pair of uh, convicts, which is a good fish for a beginner, too, very easy to breed. And uh, these fish started spawning in one of the back corners of this 50. And I didn't notice that they were spawning. They were up in behind the leaves of a big plant. And the first signal I got that there was something going on in the aquarium was I looked at it one day, and all the rest of the fish are in one half of the aquarium. Well, that's typical because once those eggs are laid and those babies drop out and become free swimming, you get a cloud of babies there in one corner of the tank. Boy, those parents really become aggressive, even to the point of fish much bigger than them. They just chase them right out of the area. So you've got to expect that if you put pairs of cichlids into the tank, if they start spawning, you're going to have to get them out. Otherwise, they're going to really raise cane with the rest of the uh, fish in the aquarium because they get very aggressive. It's, a, it's typical cichlid behaviorism. There's nothing we can do about that. Now, let's take a look at some cichlids. You know, I might, might just mention that I got a rather interesting phone call here, oh, I don't know, a month ago or so, from, from uh, somebody in New Jersey and got on the phone with them and we started talking and pretty soon the husband was on the phone with the woman and uh, gee, you know how fish nuts are when they get together. We just talked and talked and talked. They had some kind of problem. I don't know just what it was anymore, but uh, well, maybe I helped them. I hope so, but we sure, sure gave the old phone a workout that day. Love to hear from you if you got a problem. Like to talk it over with you. That's the way we really grow in this hobby is exchange of ideas. So don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you got something bothering you. Now we've got a nice array of small cichlids in this tank. And uh, they're not all going to stay very small. Some of them are going to grow. We'll talk about that as we come to them. Let's see what we've got here. Well, there's the Hero Tilapia Mullus spinosa. Now that's a rainbow cichlid. Now that fish, for all practical purposes, is a cyclosoma. The only difference between it and the cyclosoma is that it has different kind of teeth, tricuspid teeth, so it finds itself in a different genus, as I mentioned, part of the definition of the fish. That fish you see in there with it is a small festivum. Let's see what else is in this aquarium. There's a rope fish zigging through the picture there. These guys are unbelievable. There's four of them in here, and they spend all of their time under the filter. They get down in the stems all the time. They come out now and then when they get hungry. Uh, that's one of the uh, red devils again, Cyclosoma erythrium. You see a different color phase here, and the lips are just starting to develop on this guy. And up above them, one of the small Oscars, again, an Astronautus oscillatus. Now, that's the kind you fall in love with so easily. You take them home, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and... Pretty soon, uh, those little guys that you're looking at in the top, the two of them, get very large and uh, they start eating the other tank mates. So you got to be careful of that. Now there's some beautiful fire mouth in here. A nice mixture of fish, but you got to remember it. Well, some of these now are Cyclosoma mekai. I guess he's head, head on to us there. Gets his name from that beautiful red throat that he develops. There you saw a little cichlid behaviorism. That fish is a sort of middle aggressive, if you will. You probably put it in there. Oh, let's see. There's one other fish in here we ought to take a look at. You probably saw a view of a couple of both ends of them because he's quite large. But a beautiful fish. Come on, my friend. Get on the move there. It's a fire eel. He's been in here in quite a while. Very nice 
Very easy fish to keep. Just feed them right. And big enough that none of these guys are going to bother them. Now we close the covers up again because, as you remember, we told you keep them closed or the fish are going to jump on the floor. Now here's a tank with only one type of fish in it. Despite the fact that they look so very different, these are all angelfish, Terophyllum scalaire. If you were to trap angels forever in the wild, you wouldn't find any angels that look like this. About the closest you would come to it are these right here. These represent uh, pretty close to a normal angelfish. But as you look around the aquarium, you see there are different varieties from what we're looking at here, from what would be the normal angelfish, if you will. And there are, uh, well, there's a half black. That's a half black veil tail, that one on the right side of the picture there. And there's a marble molly coming up into, out of the same corner there. These are all the same angelfish. Now, there are other varieties of the, of the terophyllum, the aldum, and the dumerlai. But these are all developed from uh, the common strain of angel by selective breeding. You can see it hovering in the background there, some black veil tails. There's a couple of gold angels way over here on the left side of the this beautiful golds. By the way, they spawned in here. So if the water's right and the food is good, fish are going to react well. Now these particular type of fish, uh, the way that they develop fish like this with these long flowing tails or uh, the split colors or the variable colors, if someone notices in their aquarium at some point, gee, that fish has longer fins than the other one, he separates that out, breeds it to a good partner, saves the babies, and reinforces the line, and finally develops a strain of fish, whatever it is, whether it's angels or any of the live bearers, that will breed true. And from then on, the hobby is blessed with a new addition, but you don't find those in the wild. Now, let's see. Okay, Here's, there's only two cichlids in here. The one we looked at, the discus. The other one is a uh, timid fish. You see a couple of them there together. Waru amphia canthoides. This is a, uh, gets to be a very large fish, but uh, is very timid. Needs a lot of hiding places, but if you provide them that and feed them right, it's a beautiful fish. Very prominent lateral line on that particular fish. By the way, if you're interested in uh, cichlids, if that's your bag, let me uh, give you the address of the American Cichlid Association. And by all means, write them. Uh, I'll give you a chance to get a pencil and paper, and I'll come back to this in a minute. So if you're going to join the American Cichlid Association, get your pencil and paper in a minute. Uh, this tank uh, is full of African cichlids, a real mixed bag uh, representing only a small number of the Africans that are available. Uh, beautiful fish, quite aggressive, and uh, we'll be talking about them uh, quite a bit later on because they're uh, a show that we want to do a separate show on them. Okay, American Cichlid Association, 15019 West 21st Street, Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, and the zip is 85022. Okay, here we hit 15019 West 21st Street, Phoenix, Arizona, and the zip code is 85022. Now, let's take a look at what we have in this small tank here. Uh, we talked about the orange chromides in this first compartment. That's that Asian cichlid. And remember, I said that's an easy fish to keep and to breed. Give them a little salt. The old pike cichlid here. And uh, this is uh, the Quinicicla lepidota, and a, a beautiful fish. When these fish develop, they get some amazing colors in it. And there's a very large one in this, uh, in the big tank. And uh, boy, that, that guy's that big and that big around and very aggressive. When we feed that tank, he's really right there after things. Now, in this middle compartment, there are, is a, there's a trio of Rams, as the hobbyist calls them, Apistogramma, or Mirazai. 
This is a golden strain. This fish uh, is very easy to distinguish the sexes on these when they mature because the males develop a very high spike on the second ray of the dorsal, way out of proportion to the rest of the fin. And the epistogrammas in particular are a beautiful uh, genus. The males are extremely brilliant in color and very easy to differ differentiate between the sexes. Uh, here we have another one of, uh, I suppose, the dwarf cichlids, if you will. The rams are normally considered to be dwarf cichlids. Uh, the fish here is a uh, one of the crebensis, as the hobbyist calls them, pelvica chromis crebensis. That fish just went through a name change. It used to be pelma tachromis crebensis, but now it belongs in the pelvic acromis genus. Very active, beautiful fish. I just spawned those at home. Uh, I had them set up in an aquarium. Nothing particular, didn't give them anything particular. A clean old tank. I say old because I like the tank overgrown with algae because believe me, when those baby fish start getting free swimming, they can eat off that tank for a long time if the tank is old in terms of life in the aquarium. So I set them up, put in a clamshell upside down, and uh, they spawned in there inside that shell. And that's what they like, uh, that type of fish, or maybe a flower pot on its side. I recently reset them with a tapered rock so that I can see. I'd like to see the spawning the next time, because they'll spawn again. Good food, clean water, well, of course. Now, the, in the last compartment here, we've got uh, some severum. Now, these are gold severum. We saw big severum in the uh, um, big tank we we're looking at, those big striped guys. Now, these are small now, but they're going to grow. And again, this is a uh, albino phase of the severum, the so-called so gold severum. There's a big one right there. Just went behind that log. Now, this doesn't represent all of the cichlids. You should understand that. We're not saying that we have all of them here. It's a good cross-section of uh, representative of certainly of the type of fish that make up the cichlid family. And as I said, we'll do another show on them later on. But you've got to keep, remember, big fish, big mouths, think big.